Good day, crypto world. Uh, what an exciting week it's been. Uh, this is the Joe Schmo Show. We're glad to have you. I'm joined by Emilio and a special guest. Why don't you just briefly introduce yourself? Hey, guys. Glad to be on the show. Uh, my name is Dennis. Uh, I'm head of trading at Bitwala from Berlin, uh, Old Europe, Germany. Cool, cool. So we're going to have all kinds of things to talk about on the show. Just at the top of the, at the show, we like to talk about how many ATMs are out there. And it's just, there's just a rapid, rapid growth in the ATM market. There are now 5,865 crypto ATMs. And keep in mind, these ATMs definitely protect your privacy and security, unlike the bank's ATMs, right? So what do, what do you think about that, Emilio? 5,800 ATMs and growing. I think we're uh, 11 short on that count because I haven't uh, posted mine on Coin ATM Radar <laughs> yet. Okay, well, I got to hit refresh at some point here. I don't... <laughs> but that's cool. You got 11 more. And that's the thing. People are adding 10, 20, 30 ATMs a week. It's crazy, man. Yeah. Yeah. N not us yet, but soon. Uh, we're doing mm -hmm. like 20, 20 a month or so. And I'm told that the IRI on these things are insane, like less than a year. You can get your money back. Yeah. So, yeah. Especially with, I mean, Bitcoin. Do, do you know anybody with the heart condition? Because last week, Bitcoin went up 40%. I mean, you need to jumpstart somebody's heart. That'll do it, right? <laughs> That's so 40, right. 40%. It doesn't even make national news or anything like that, international news. I mean, imagine if the, the Dow went up 40%. Everybody would be like freaking out. You know, Bitcoin goes up 40%. It's like, oh, okay. They've had enough of the price stories. So. Ah, is that what it is? Yeah, well, maybe, maybe, when, maybe when it hits uh, 30K or so. <laughs> they'll, they'll cover it again when it goes down 40, I guess. So sure. bad news is, is more interesting than good news. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing. It's crazy now. It's like what the, how high the bar has been set for... Uh, for a hundred billion dollar, you know, market. I mean, that's the thing. So if I go to Litecoin Watch, which is my favorite site, um, it shows uh, the volume, right? And is it, it went from ten thousand, uh, ten billion. Uh, I got to get the numbers. They're getting so big. Ten billion of volume on uh, just a few days ago to nearly thirty billion of volume. Just in a few days, it went 20 billion of volume extra. That's just crazy, crazy numbers. But it, so, it was only it was only the third best day ever. So I guess that that doesn't warrant coverage. Uh, what, what are you going to do? They better they're puppet better next time. <laughs> oh, wow. It's just shocking, shocking. So what do you what do you think of the reason why you know we have such huge volumes and everything, Amelia? What do you, what do you think is going on? Um, I think I mean it's it's uh, leveraged trading. So um, trading platforms like Bitmax and, uh, and some of that other uh, had a, a lot of short interest at around uh, what was it sixty five hundred dollars. So um, since there was a lot of short interest, then they had to pump up the price and. Uh, and clear, clear the, the, those accounts that we're trying to short. People so, lost their shorts on shorts. Okay, I, yeah. I got that. Uh, Dennis, what do, what do you think are the reasons behind uh, this, well, this crazy thing? There, there was a certain China man that supposedly held a very important speech on the topic of cryptocurrency, Bitcoin in particular. And also, I think the reason for the, for the dump a couple of days prior was the expiration uh, don't don't quote me on that uh, of some sort of futures contracts. Uh, I know I don't know if it was CME or CBOE. So part of the the rally was um, probably just people recovering um, or reinvesting their profits that they made from um, playing the markets on the futures. So it was sort of a perfect storm. The, uh, I remember reading that there were a bunch of large blocks being sold on a uh, couple of the exchanges, uh, namely Bitstamp, uh, that comprise the index uh, that that certain future that expired was uh, priced upon. So I mean, you put two and two together, and you know all this money has to go back into the market at some point. And if you can time it uh, with someone from China and making some some positive remarks about crypto, all the better, right? 
Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. I think somebody probably had a little insider knowledge on that speech then. I'm sure a few people did. I, so, yeah, I think it's all clean. <laughs> uh, along with that, I mean, you mentioned China. I don't think people really understand the importance of that China announcement. Um, unlike the U.S. and the rest of the world, um, China has actually been embracing cryptocurrency lately. And I know they are only saying blockchain, blockchain, but if you read the law, the way the law is written, the new law that they will take effect on January 1, uh, if you're a resident or a citizen or whatever of China, you can do anything with cryptocurrency. You can mine it, you can buy it, you can sell it, you can create your own, um, you can do whatever you want with cryptocurrency, the way that law is written. And so now you're going to have a billion people with absolute freedom to do whatever they want with cryptocurrency. That's the way the law. So China is not going to ban Bitcoin again. Again? So, I mean, I, re I remember a couple of times uh, uh, when, when they did or supposedly did, which was uh, totally not manipulation, I guess. Uh, right. But uh, if, if, if it's true, then uh, so this, this announcement in the first minutes went way beyond me because I just woke up. So it was early in the morning in, in my time. I just woke up, saw the spike, and, and, and I don't know, it didn't even bother checking for news. But if you've been in the game long enough, 10, 20, 30 percent, eh, you know, go, no to, go back to sleep, right? Um, so what's, what's, what are some of the specifics uh, you think in the Chinese announcement that make you so bullish on, on Chinese sentiment on, on crypto? Well, it may not be so much about what the people are thinking, but it's about the way the law is written, uh, the way that China uh, new regulation is written. Um, that's where, I mean, that's the, the speech is just the forefront of it. And that's where he goes, oh, you know, definitely don't speculate or whatever, for whatever reason he's saying that. But if you look at the way that it's written, he's encouraging, um, you know, the Chinese to come up with new innovation around any cryptocurrency, not just the China cryptocurrency, the China national cryptocurrency they're coming out with. So that's the way the law is written is that he's not saying you can only use just the China virtual currency they're coming out with, but any, any crypto. How do, how do you put the Zuckerberg testimony into that? So that was perfectly timed as well, right? It was right the day before and then the next day. So on the one end, uh, Zuckerberg gets grilled on how many LGBTQ key, whatever comp uh, employees his company has in, in, in a very important meeting uh, hearing. And then the next day, China goes on stage and kind of sweeps, takes out the rug from under under Congress. That was that was impressive. Yeah, I think that's the other side of the house. Uh, I mean, it's sad that you got Facebook uh, right now doing this whole thing because they're really poisoning the water. I think that was the strategy uh, that perhaps this group came up with is they wanted to poison the water uh, for all of cryptocurrency by using Facebook, right? Uh, because now you got to already a company that's pretty hated, right? And then on top of that, you know, he goes in front of Congress, which is perfect timing for Brad Sherman to say, oh, yeah, this is uh, uh, this is only drug dealers and terrorists and uh, taxpayers. I'm sorry, tax evaders are the people that use cryptocurrency, right? Um, and so that's going to give rise to perhaps some, you know, calls by the feds and others to legislate, try and legislate Bitcoin, but as we know, it cannot be legislated, right? So is your, your criticism towards uh, Libra or Libra, I, I confuse it all the time. So uh, your criticism is based upon the fact that uh, US-based companies on, on the board, or I mean, if you're, if you're going for the separation of um, money and state, much as we have gone through the separation of church and state, then of course it has to be a big company. Uh, um, you know, if, if Bitcoin doesn't uh, revolutionize it, then there's going to be a company um, or a, a conglomerate of companies um, acting in the same vein. So, I mean, there's only a handful of players that could ever achieve um, such a feat. So it's obvious that, you know, pay, uh, um, PayPal is out obviously, but Facebook and, and others uh, would be, um, you know, be on the forefront of this. So what's your precise criticism? except for privacy issues and that they're all American. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you look at it, Google already knows a whole heck of a lot about you. And let's say Google comes out with their own cryptocurrency, then they're going to know 
Well, everything about you. And then if Google comes out with their supremacy AI, well, that gets very scary at that point, right? So that's the question is, how much do you want to place into the hands of people that say, just trust us and don't be evil? Uh, they removed that claim, by the way, right? Oh, yeah. yeah so how funny is that? Uh, they actually did. So basically, if if you just replace fiat with Libra, then it's the same. It's the same uphill battle. It's just a, a different opponent in, in in that sense. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, so leading up to those types of things, it's just going to get really interesting as we uh, move on. I think uh, the U.S. regulators are going to. It's going to be odd, but they're going to try to regulate. Uh, cryptocurrency to so-called protect the children from the evils of Facebook Libra. Um, and then you got China on the other side that are saying, yeah, we want to revolutionize the world. So China may end up in the better position um, at the end of this. It's really interesting. But if, if you really look into it, then like when it comes to mobile payment, China is way ahead of everybody else as it is with WeChat and Alipay. I think they have, what, 850 million combined users, and it's pretty much a 40, 60 oligopoly. And then if you look, I think I saw European numbers for Apple Pay, it's only in the, in the tens of millions of users. So basically, everybody's just playing to catch up. And I don't know if, if I'd rather have a Facebook-led uh, crypto currency or if, if I'd rather have the Chinese come up with their scheme and try and take over the world. Or better, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum and those other ones, you know, something else uh, comes out of it that's more decentralized. Yeah. So I think that's where we're, we're headed. And then along with that, you know, there's a, a lot of uh, people really coming out with some innovative applications and so forth. I mean, we may yet see uh, the next better version of Facebook, you know, monster app built on cryptocurrency that's completely trustless. So yeah. along with that, um, you know, we have, at least on the economic front, uh, we have some actually very scary news uh, where the feds are dumping in 80 billion uh, per day on the short term market. So that's, that's really causing things to be difficult uh, from a monetary standpoint, when you have that much uh, money just being thrown into the system, devaluing the dollar. And then on top of that, you have all the structural problems. You know, the farmers are overproducing, the people aren't buying their goods. Uh, you have, uh, you know, finished goods declining from America because of difficulties importing products from China. Um, you have Europe, which is like, well, you're there, you know. Who knows what's going to Dennis? You know, who knows what's going to happen on the next day? It's like, well, what were you saying? You were just telling me something, Dennis, about a cartoon or something you saw. Right, right. Well, I saw I saw this cartoon this week where there's two businessmen walking down the road, and one says, "Well, what do you do for a living?" And the other says, "Well, I'm a Brexit negotiator, as was my father and his father before him." So it it could play on for for quite a while. This whole theater. I think there's a new. The, a new vote on the on the twelfth. I don't know. It's it's being proposed. Yeah. I actually I actually stopped following like the menu team a while ago because it's just you're you're getting overwhelmed with stupidity and you know just strange people uh, telling strange stories. Uh, so we'll see what's left of Europe by the end of the year. Um, in the end, uh, they could they could just drift off for all I care. Uh, and, you know, relocate somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, you know, whatever, whatever suits them. So well, what's going on? Who is your, who's your issuer for Bidwalla? Uh, do you have a sponsoring bank or? Certain... Uh, yeah, we, we, so we are, um, we're working together with a bank in Berlin, Sol Solaris Bank, oh, who's cool. providing the banking infrastructure and we're providing all the wallets, uh, the trading and everything, all the services that, that come around it. So that for the customer, it, it sort of seems like, um, a seamless experience. Nice. D did you did you guys pivot by any chance? Because uh, I I almost remember Bitwallet doing something a little different. Well, we started out by just um, connecting uh, BitPay and a bank account that was run by us, and you could just you know put in anybody's um, 
IBAN, like bank details, and send us Bitcoin. Basically, they would go to BitPay, that would go to the bank account, and we would send out the euro once a day. Um, so it's basically against all AML rules. Um, that's probably part of the reason why end of 17, when people were buying literal houses and estates with their crypto money through us, you can imagine like a five a five people company cashing out like huge amounts of millions of euros per day and that got that got shut down so and then wavecrest that was uh, the uh, prepaid visa card we had lost yeah. their visa license and so yeah we were kind of like like fish without water right so we shut down regrouped um huddled and uh, said we're going to relaunch with a proper product with a proper banking product and uh, sort of uh, roll roll out from starting from Germany where it's most heavily regulated um, and move from there and so that's how our current product came to be which functionally is only slightly different because it's your own bank account where the money goes to yeah uh, not someone else's but you know that's that's pretty much the story very nice I like that. all right very cool so yeah I I'm excited about what y'all are doing and uh uh, along with that, I mean, it's it's a little difficult, I think, for the average consumer to really understand how the whole Bitcoin thing works. So anything that makes it easier, I think, is it's fantastic. So here you got uh, an app that. So just walk it through me. I'm let's say I'm you know I like my dad. I always like to use the story of my dad. You know, he's yeah. seventy years old. You know, he's retired and. Somebody says, oh, check out BitWallet. I'd like to say, oh, check out PayPal, right? right so yeah. he brings up his uh, iPhone 6S. It's not even that current, you know. Uh, what what happens? Walk me through what happens to it. So what, what happens is uh, you go through an, a KYC process, which is which includes a video ident and proof of address and all that stuff because, you know, there's a bank involved. and. Uh, as we all know, that German KYC regulations are amongst the strictest uh, in Europe. And then basically you have a web app and iOS app and Android app, so the success will do fine. Uh, and you will have your bank account. If your father can operate a bank account, he can operate the Bawala bank account just fine. And, uh, and, the v and the MasterCard to go along with it. So swiping that card should be feasible for a 70 year old. And then you have a crypto wallet. So basically, if he wants to buy a Bitcoin, he, and he has money on his bank account. It's basically two clicks entering a password, and then ten minutes later he has Bitcoin on his multi-sig wallet, to which he holds the keys, like this twenty-four word twenty-four word passphrase. And once Bitcoin goes ten x, he decides to sell them. And so he goes to his Bitwala app, clicks, uh, taps on the sell button, enters an amount of euro he wants to receive, and ten minutes later the money is on his account. And that's pretty much all there is to it. So we're really striving to provide a very simple, straightforward and, and fluent, effortless uh, user experience uh, for going in and out of crypto. And we're obviously going to branch out in uh, following uh, DeFi, offering custody solution, uh, lending, investing and all these all these side products. So right now we're pretty much testing the waters with the, with the crypto early adopter geekish community. That's basically the people who, who uh, half of them carried over from the Bewala 1.0. And then we recruit our, our customer base from those who are already deeply into crypto, are cashing out and are actively trading. So we uh, actually monitor our trading behavior of the users and we can see that we basically have the same volume uh, relationship in regards to volatility as in the, in the common market. Um, yeah, so basically right now it's uh, just a Bitcoin in, Bitcoin out and spend live up your crypto solution. So we have many digital nomads, freelancers uh, that just travel the world, get paid in Bitcoin uh, and, you know, pay in the local currency and all these services are totally free except for trading where we just take 1%. So for cashing in and out of euro, we take 1% each uh, and it's easy as pie. Uh, you can just use it, which is, you know, uh, much more than you can say about pretty much every other crypto product. Uh, so try to reset or update the Ledger Nano S or any of these um, uh, any of these things. It's it's pretty difficult for for my mother-in-law that, that I always use uh, as in in my examples. Uh, so this one's really just a straightforward iOS app, easy to handle.
Very, very cool. Well, you mentioned uh, some things about making it easier for users and so forth. And I know one of the things that's always very difficult is, you know, you have the, just imagine the, uh, the guy that's a landscaper that comes along and he likes to usually get paid in cash because it's supposedly untraceable or whatever, right? But the problem, you know, the all the problems with cash, right? So especially if you're in Venezuela. So um, how could uh, somebody that uh, just wants to be a landscaper type of thing um, get paid in cash? How could they use your platform instead? So the, the issue is that we don't currently offer business accounts. So if, if you're a freelancer, it might work for you. Uh, if you get paid in cash, you get paid in cash. If you get paid in crypto, then you get paid in crypto. You can put them on, on, on our account and then cash out to Euro at an ATM. But there's a caveat, there's a bank involved. So, you know, as soon as that money touches bank land, it's subject to all the stuff that goes on there, like all the ML and regulations uh, that you have to, to go with there. So basically, we're not a product uh, to, to easily cash out your Silk Road earnings. Um, we are actually uh, seeing that many of the Bitcoins that are being deposited with us come from unregulated entities. So basically, uh, people are trading on BitMEX or OKX or, you know, FTX, whatever you have. And, um, you know, it's it's all good. But if you have your stable coins uh, or your, 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 your crypto on an exchange, uh, there's a certain degree of uncertainty that goes with it. So they actually, which, this is what we find, actually prefer on average to hold their crypto in an entity that is subject um, uh, to regulation and to oversight, let's put it that way. And we see a lot of influx uh, from, from these sorts of platforms from people who just needed a way to cash out on their profits or on their holdings, right? And if like, those days, um, as we witnessed, um, when, when volatility is high, we uh, also experience lots of buyers um, who uh, want to cash into Bitcoin to then trade altcoins on other exchanges. So it's, it's sort of an, um, not, not only a product where you can live off your, your profits, but it's, only, it's also an on-ramp um, into the whole crypto ecosystem. And that's obviously where we want to bring everybody. Um, not to put it into like a 401k or just a savings account with Wells Fargo, but you know to take part of DeFi things that are on the horizon that are decentralized and permissionless. Very very cool. Well, uh, what you mentioned, you know, businesses and whatnot, you know, uh, which is the other side of the house. I know uh, business, a lot of businesses they want to pay their employees, um, you know, in some simple way, you know. So, and I know others are exploring uh, that market. There are a few Bitcoin payroll companies already. So, do you think there could be any kind of a relationship with uh, Bitcoin payroll companies to make it easier for employees to get paid? We're, so, we're looking into every aspect of this, uh, just that we, for now, since we're just starting out, so this product we have is pretty basic with Bitcoin and out, we sort of had to focus on, on one group, which is the early adopters, and we don't see businesses necessarily as a large market in the early adopter segment, if you, if you follow. Right? So, if there's the occasional, very um, nouveau uh, company that wants to pay their uh, employees in Bitcoin, uh, then at least in Germany, it's uh, it's a can of worms taxation-wise that most employees and most employers, more importantly, prefer to avoid. But you can make your Butwala account your salary account, and then you can receive your salary. And if you decide to buy bitcoins off that, uh, you know that's that's a feasible workaround. But um, we've we've looked into the market of crypto salary, and I think the. Um, the amount of risk people are trying to take on with their salary before they get it is relatively small. I mean, there's we all know people who hold a bunch of crypto and who'd rather only hold less fiat, but most people have day-to-day -day expenses. They absolutely have to pay in fiat. And, you know, what, what little is left then can go back into crypto. Very cool. I think the cat wants to say something, Emilio. Yeah. Uh, uh, what, what do you think? I'm going to get very sick. But yeah, uh, I, I agree with you. Um, the, uh, the, the, I, I honestly, it's if someone has this idea of getting paid in Bitcoin, it's probably uh, one of the founders. Uh, and then they have, they think that uh, the employees might want to, but uh, I think that the, the segment for 
for people getting paid in Bitcoin is super small. So, um, so I agree with your your business decision there to to have it be uh, uh, just a, a B to C model instead of B to B um, because you're just letting the consumer make the choice instead of uh, B to B and then have like no users. So that's a smart idea. Uh, also, the B two B case is becomes more interesting the more international the business is. So if I want to send uh, my friends who live in Germany, or if I want to pay another business that's in the same country as I am, there really is no there is really is no profound reason to do that in crypto other than maybe saving me the hassle of cashing out and then paying in fiat. But if I have someone who who delivers from or manufactures for me in South Korea or Gambia or Namibia or you know wherever, uh, then then we are entering into an area where the cost savings um, aspect of this might make it interesting to to make these kinds of payments. Or if I am uh, paying people in a country that I cannot make easily make a transfer through that doesn't have a banking infrastructure. So, um, yeah, it all goes back to this unbanked thing for private users, and it goes back to the internationalization. So large payment, if I, if I order a whole shipload of wheat, not wheat, wheat, or steel <laughs> bars from, from, from India, then, you know, it might be feasible to pay in Bitcoin or at least have someone uh, who has uh, custody in Bitcoin and then do kind of an escrow deal. Uh, rather than uh, you know ex exchanging currency at a local bank for for uh, awful rates, but you know that's not the use case that we're focusing on. But that's uh, very doable. Yeah, that's exactly the thing I was thinking of. I know a lot of folks think only in country when it comes to businesses, but increasingly uh, businesses are international. Um, and to that end, I mean, people tend to travel as well. I know uh, another case that's also very difficult is. Uh, when people travel to another country, trying to figure out how to access that local currency is extremely difficult. Um, and you talk about fees. I mean, some of these banks really get you on the fee for getting the international currency. And so that's where I think Bitcoin ATMs actually have a, a strong play. I know if I travel, I would definitely look for a Bitcoin ATM to get a, a withdrawal because it would actually be cheaper. All right. So not to take away from ATMs. Um, but, you know, there, we only have very few in, in Germany because of uh, regulations, uh, but the fees on those are basically between 3 and 7%, give or take, depending on markets, depending on if you, if you buy or sell, so it is quite substantial. And actually, the, the birthing place of Bitwala was when the founders, then friends, only friends, uh, were uh, together in Thailand, and they all had substantial crypto holdings. And, you know, they were strapped for cash and they just wondered, wouldn't, shouldn't there be an easy way to access your crypto no matter what? So don't be tied to a certain outlet. So basically, that's when they came up with the idea of con connecting uh, like a bank account and a prepaid credit card um, with BitPay so they could just remotely cash out. And next day they'd have their credit card and then they would be able to withdraw a local currency. I mean, you get, you get probably... Uh, uh, robbed on, on fees on local uh, conversions for the currency at ATMs. Um, but I mean, it's it's still the conversion rate on, Bit, on Bitwala is 1%. And if you pay another 2% on, on uh, local currency fees at the ATM, then you're in these regions that you have with the Bitcoin ATM. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So, I mean, there's a lot of different ways, I think, to, uh, I guess it, the big thing is to offer consumers uh, choices and freedom. And I think Bitcoin mm -hmm. actually, uh, Bitcoin itself actually gives the user more of that freedom over any other currency. Uh, I know with a lot of the other currencies, maybe not so much the US dollar, but there's already restrictions being placed on other currencies. Um, you know, especially if you look at uh, in Africa, you know, if you're in Ghana, for example, and you try to travel, it is very difficult to get uh, the Ghana currency exchange to any other currency, uh, which limits their ability to trade and it limits their ability to work. So mm -hmm. imagine if you're a developer or programmer in Ghana, uh, your options are actually really limited, um, as opposed to, say, being in Europe and so forth, which is the reason why some of these people travel then to Europe, right? So if you want to limit the number of people that are immigrating for work, well, you have to provide them the ability to work. 
And I, again, that's where I'm looking at some of these different solutions um, that are now coming to bear. So I think it's great. So, all right. Well, um, yeah. and, and many African countries already have the infrastructure. So every like there's in Nigeria, I think there's two 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 cell phones for every citizen. So there should be yeah. no reason. Um, PESA is very prevalent there, so there should be no reason why the system like this shouldn't shouldn't take hold, right? But just on the subject, um, I, I always share this story. How I came across Bitcoin was in 2010 when I read about it on ZDNet, some news website, and I wanted to wire 500 euro to Mount Gox, right, to Japan, and my bank wouldn't let me uh, because I only had a certain ton system that they didn't support for international. Um, Transfers and so you know that bank immediately helped me understand what Bitcoin is good for, right? Because who who are they to tell me what to do with my money, where to send it? It's none of their damn business. So uh, you know they had my epiphany right there, and from 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 that moment on, um, I believe that uh, you know in 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 the room 77 in that bar that it was the first place in the world to accept Bitcoin as payment for burgers. We have this. Um, we have this toast that says to freedom of transaction, and that's what we all believe in here. So people should be able to transact freely and without, you know, being encumbered by any sort of uh, naysayers or people who tell you what to do. I, I believe that that will be the future and the way to go. For sure, for sure. Thoughts, Amelia? Yeah, I mean, I heard, I uh, I really resonate with uh, your last statement there. My uh, my mother has been trying to take out uh, eight thousand dollars from her bank account. Uh, but the bank will only let her withdraw two thousand dollars a day, so uh, she has to go there for four days in order to get her eight thousand dollars in cash. So, um, so what country yeah. is that? And U.S. and oh, uh, New sorry, York. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. I hear they're printing. I, I, for for I mean, they're printing so much money. Why couldn't they just add another six and give it to her, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's the thing. It's not, none of this printing money ends up good. I mean, uh, just a relevant example. I mean, sorry, but it's Germany, you know, toward the end of World War II. Uh, actually, this is a funny thing. I can't find, my dad is a, a currency collector, and I can't easily find uh, some of the German marks from the end of World War II, right? You can, and it's very they hard. They are burned for heat, or I don't, I don't follow the I currency. Know. Well, they're, right all, they're all gone. They're all gone. Every, it's like, uh, see, I can get Venezuelan dollars for whatever it's worth, right? The Venezuelan uh, currency. Um, but I, yeah, it's interesting. And so I think actually you might see the same thing happening uh, over the next few years uh, to the current currencies, like the dollar uh, and so forth, because it's going to be a collector's item over the next few years. I really think so, because at the rate they're printing, <laughs> it never ends well. It never ends well. Um, and to go back to the economic theory, right? So it, it doesn't matter how you inflate the balloon, right? And you're inflating it at 80 billion a day just on this side. They're inflating it on other markets, right? It doesn't matter how you inflate the balloon. Eventually, it pops. So what, what, what's, your, what's your event horizon? T minus five years, ten years. Less. Well, the trigger uh, will be Brexit. The trigger is Brexit. <laughs> is that a joke? <laughs> it's a prediction. Um, I, 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 I mean, I think fiat currencies will be around, especially the dollar, for a, a while. Um, I think that you know, obviously, some of the other countries that are in economic turmoil, uh, might, their fiat currency might not be around for that longer. Like Venezuela, um, there's, uh, or this, Venezuela is probably the best example of uh, a country in a turmoil that we might not see their, their currency around for much longer, um, at least that I can think of. Can you guys think of any, any others? But I, I think that U U.S. currency will be around for a little bit of time, a little bit. But I think that U.S., um, I mean, it already is, it feels much like a second world country uh, right now. Um, when I visit Europe and, and other countries in the world, it's, they're very comparable. Um, so I, I really don't know. Uh, a lot of people in the U.S. are they're very, very poor. Um, and I don't really see that much uh, poverty when I go. I mean, there is poverty in, in Europe and, and stuff, but there's uh, it's very 
very much less less dramatic. But uh, there's there's an equal amount of poverty, maybe, but there's also better health care, social care, uh, you know, all these things that are uh, um, communist or, or you know, um, instituted by democratic parties, which is, by, by, I guess, in, in the States, that would be the, the synonymous. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we have our we have our own problems. Uh, we also see in, in uh, like a rising of right wing and left wing parties. Like there's very little in in the middle, uh, so to speak. A model that you perfectly uh, live for us. Uh, so you basically politically you're living ten years in the future, and I'm I'm kind of scared of what's what's going to happen to Europe once this whole dichotomy it, once it plays out in full. But you know that will then add to the fuel that you know starts heating up the air for the balloon. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think uh, Germany will be fine. Um, I, I worry about countries like uh, Portugal and Spain. Um, yeah, and France. <laughs> but, but I think Germany will uh, be fine. Well, economically, Italy. yeah. But... Italy, uh, the, the countries with the most holidays will probably be uh, in turmoil. <laughs> like Italy, uh, France, Spain, and Portugal. <laughs> Well, I think it boils down to, you know, just uh, where we want to go uh, long term, uh, even as a, as a society, right? We, we hit this wall, right? Where, because remember, economic expansion previously to all of this was always driven by conquering some new territory, right? Uh, even World War II was another version of that, right? Uh, conquering some territory. Um, but now we've hit this wall where that economic expansion formula almost doesn't play out. And I, I will point to you again, uh, Elon Musk actually has the right idea for what's next. Uh, as a, even as a species, we need to go conquer some, some planets here, you know, if we want to expand as a civilization. Um, and to even add fuel to that fire, NASA actually wants to do a mission to an asteroid uh, which I fully support. There's a there's an asteroid out there, and the asteroid belt is not that far away. It would only cost a hundred billion uh, to get there and bring it back. And before you say that's too much money, they spent half a trillion building pipelines in the last few years. All right, pipelines for oil. That's not something we need more of. So you look at a uh, hundred billion to get to get this asteroid and to bring it back and park it off of say. Uh, I don't know, let's just plunk it down next to, you know, United Kingdom, because they certainly need the work, right? That asteroid is worth something like a hundred quintillion dollars. The thing is, if you were to put that asteroid here on Earth, it would destroy the world's economies because it's worth too much. If that doesn't show that the economic formula that we've been living on is not, is not broken, I mean, I don't know what does. And the thing is, only currencies like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the others can be used to quantify and to manipulate that kind of problem, right? The current dollar can't. It, it just doesn't work. Well, you can just print the amount of dollars it takes to buy the damn asteroid, right? It doesn't, <laughs> the rest of it doesn't work. I know you can do that, but then everybody has too many dollars. Oops. I mean, are you going to walk around with a hundred quintillion dollar bill in your pocket? They tried that in Venezuela. I think we have some notes from Zimbabwe that, that were worth similar amounts. Yeah, what, what was it? One trillion or something like that? Yeah, I think in, in Germany, in the, in the end, they only printed money on one side of the paper because they knew it would be worthless like the, the couple, couple of hours even later. So, I mean, yeah. That's exactly the problem. So if you want a way to um, have a system to drive future processes and even future profits, then you, don't, you need a cryptocurrency. That's the only one that works. That's what everybody's realizing slowly but surely. So is it, will it be a, an asteroid-backed currency or? <laughs> I'm all for that. 
how, how are you going to park that asteroid nice and slowly so it doesn't, you know, make a big wave and New York goes bye bye? <laughs> Uh, let, I don't know. Make sure Elon Musk is the one behind it. He'll make okay. sure. <laughs> just par- put him a Tesla and, you know, just auto, <laughs> auto park it. Yeah. I that's mean, he, he got a Tesla car in orbit. I mean, yeah. that's, that's impressive. <laughs> it's going to come crashing down. <laughs> so, all right. Well, final thoughts. Um, I think it's a great show. Um, I think our listeners would certainly enjoy it, but any any final questions? Uh, I'll just I'll just toast to Freedom of Transaction and you'll all see you guys uh, at the moon if it doesn't uh, come crashing down first. Exactly. All right, Emilio. To Freedom of Transaction, I love that. To Freedom of Transaction. All right, all right. great show, guys. All right, Thank cheers. You. Thank you. Cheers. Signing off from Berlin. Bye. Bye.